us this morning. Let us come to the Lord in prayer, please. The day has come, O God, when we celebrate your triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It is easy to get caught up in the shouts of Hosanna and the jubilation of the day and forget the week ahead. Guide us in this time of worship to not only celebrate your anticipated triumph, but to see the road ahead. Touch our hearts and souls as we seek to worship you in honor and glory. For we ask it in the name of our Son, Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples and us to pray. Our Father, Time for announcements, and, and I would just like to uh, tell Anna and Wayne, welcome it for me, and to let you know again, because I know you're not going to remember everybody's name, but since I've been traipsing through your house, <laughs> and I haven't broken anything, I'm, I'm Shelly Craven, and so glad to have you here. Any announcements added? Wednesday is 6.30 prayer time, and Saturday... April 3rd at 9.30 is the Easter egg hunt. Diana? We will be on a Good Friday service, Friday night at 7 p.m. Good Friday service, Friday night at 7. Anything else? For those of you at home, Pam is encouraging you to join in on prayer time at 6.30 Wednesday night. You can come here or you can still do it on Zoom and uh, just come together as a church. Diana. Okay, no sunrise service for Easter this year. Have I left anything out or anybody out? Don't mean to. If not, let's welcome Wayne, and his message today is about the triumphal entry. I've got cut. It wasn't you, okay? I hope there's no lawsuits over that. It would not be good. But we do appreciate your hospitality and warm reception we've had here in Erie. And we are looking forward to a wonderful ministry here in the days ahead. A um, teenage boy had just gotten his driver's license. And he came to his father and he said, Dad, now that I have my driver's license, can I have a car? Now translate that means, Dad, would you buy me a car? Just in case you didn't know. And the father said, well, son, we'll get you a car, but first you got to get your grades up. And I would simply say to those of you who may be in that situation now or later, uh, our insurance company gave a break if our kids were on the honor roll. 
And so we told our kids, uh, we'll pay the insurance if you're on the honor roll. If not, you pay the extra insurance. And would you believe those rascals' grades went up? <laughs> so he said, son, you can, um, you got to get your grades up. You got to clean your room and you got to get a haircut. Well, sometime later, the boy came back to his father and he said, Dad, he said, uh, I've got my room cleaned up and I've got my grades up. Can I have a car? And Dad said, well, that's good, but uh, what about the haircut? And the uh, son said, well, yes, but Dad, but uh, Jesus had long hair. And his dad said, well, that's probably right. But Jesus walked every place he went. <laughs> Today we're going to look at a passage which is the only event in the life of Jesus recorded for us where he rode and didn't walk. It's found in Matthew chapter 21. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, now ironically... The other Gospels mention two disciples, but they didn't get named. I kind of like who it was. Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you'll find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Say to the two daughters Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them out on the road. Now John specifically mentions to us that they were Palm branches. He's the only one that specifically identifies the kind of branches. The crowds that went ahead of, the, of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowd answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Galilee, from Nazareth in Galilee. Let me ask you a question. You're sitting at, on your front porch this afternoon, or maybe standing out in your front yard visiting with somebody, and your pickup is parked on the curb, or maybe even the driveway. You've left the keys in it, you're going to go someplace, okay? And a couple of guys come along and they get in it and they start it up and you say, what are you doing? And they say to you, my boss has need of this. How are you going to respond? Can you imagine how this guy responded when they came and said, I'm going to borrow your donkeys for a while. There's really no explanation about what goes on or how long they were going to take them. Now Matthew is the only gospel writer that mentions the mama donkey, okay? All the rest of them only mention the colt. The prophet Zechariah said it was a colt. The other prophet says, a, and Matthew says, go to the village ahead of you and just as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it to me. Now let me ask you another question. How many... Ha, ha, have you ever tried riding a donkey or a horse or a mule or even a cow for that matter who's never been ridden? How did that go for you, okay? <laughs> this event... It's what we call the triumphal entry. It happened on what we call Palm Sunday. Almost all scholars would agree that it happened on Sunday. This was Palm Sunday. 
This is one of the few events that, uh, in the life of Jesus that we find recorded by all the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is the beginning of what we call the Passion Week. How many of you saw the movie The Passion? Mel Gibson. In which, you know, passion simply means largely suffering. And Mel Gibson's movie focused largely on the suffering of Jesus. How many of you been to the great passion play in Eureka Springs? Not very many of you. We spent a couple of weeks there a few years ago one summer working. and It's a great play. Uh, I got a chance to even be in it. Uh, I'm just one of the crowd. My wife, my grandchildren rent it. Uh, you need to go. It, it's, it's worth your while. And I love the way they end it with a hallelujah chorus. It just sends goosebumps up your back. But this is what we call the Passion Week, and it begins with the triumphal entry, and uh, the next day is the cleansing of the temple, and then there's the cursing of the fig tree, and then you have a, a day or more than one day of controversy, where Jesus is in this debate uh, and argument with the religious leaders. And then uh, on Thursday is the Passover Supper, the Last Supper. And from there they go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And there Jesus prays, Father, not my will, but your will be done. And you remember how the story goes. The disciples went to sleep on the job that night. And while they're in the garden, the religious leaders come with their soldiers, and they take him his place of prayer, and they arrest him. And all that night, they have him before a kangaroo court. They lied about him. They falsely accuse him. They bind him. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They put a robe, purple robe on him. They spit on him. They hit him. They had him flogged. They drag him before Annas, who had been the high priest, who was well-respected among the other religious leaders. Then they drag him before Caiaphas, who is the high priest at that point, and then later back to Annas, and then before Pilate, and then to Herod and then back to Pilate and by nine o'clock in the Friday morning they had what they wanted they had the Roman authorities nailing him to a cross and by three o'clock that afternoon he's dead his friends place him in a tomb on the third day the tomb can no longer hold him Death can no longer keep him. He arises. Only two of the gospel writers mention anything at all about Jesus' birth. Matthew and Luke. Only one out of the four gospel writers mention anything about what happened between his birth and his ministry. Almost 30 years of nothing. Only Luke mentions that event when he's in the temple at 12 years old. So basically the Gospels are the ministry of the life of Jesus. But as you look at them, almost the last half, well, maybe 35-40% of it if you can get technical, is that last week in the life of Jesus, which begins with the triumphal entry, ends with the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. You see, that was his purpose in coming. He often told his disciples about his impending death and resurrection, but they didn't seem to comprehend it. They weren't quite ready to accept it. Now, there was three major feasts that the Jews observed. There was Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. And if you lived within a certain distance, you need to come to Jerusalem to help celebrate this. And this was a time of the Passover. And the city was packed with people, with visitors who'd come to celebrate the Passover. And with them, they had brought their Passover lamb to be sacrificed. This was a major event in the life of the nation of the Jews. Now, as I look at that, there's one thing that strikes me, that is the preparation. You see, one cannot look at this event, not even with a casual glance, without understanding that God's hand is at work here. It was God that prepared this. First, there was God knowing where that donkey would be tied. And then knowing that the master, the owner, would let him use it. And finally, I think it's a miracle that Jesus could ride on this animal that had never been ridden before. And if you've ever tried on riding on one, you probably know it's a miracle. 
And finally, there was that fulfillment of the Old Testament scripture in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey and on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. Every Jew knew this was a messianic passage. When they talk about the son of David, they're talking about the Messiah that's going to come. This is the coming king they were looking for. They were sure Jesus was the one. And let me remind you that ever messianic prophecy, the scholars say there was something like 300 plus, Jesus fulfilled every one of them. That alone is adequate reason to trust him. One other thing happened also on those days. They brought the lamb to be sacrificed and they had to be inspected. All the religious leaders had a monopoly going. You'd bring your animal and they'd find some fault with it so they could sell you one of their own at an exaggerated price. But Jesus, the Lamb of God, is presenting himself on that day for everyone to see. He knows the days ahead of him are few. But if you look at the timing, it's not accidental. It's not coincidental. It was planned by God. And then there was a procession. Jesus rides that donkey, a borrowed donkey at that, a donkey, a lowly beast of burden. If he's really the king, why a donkey? I mean, why not a big white stallion leading the way with people shouting, Behold, the king is coming. Why not a stallion with soldiers standing around to protect him from all harm? That would have been a sign of authority and power and triumph. Why a lowly beast of burden? I mean, he's the Lord of the universe. Why can't he commandeer a Lisa White stallion? That should be just easy. He's finding a donkey, shouldn't it? Do you remember how Jesus defined himself? I learned this in the King James, uh, so we'll quote it from there. In Matthew chapter 11. Come to me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And you shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The NIV and the New Living Bible translated, I am gentle and humble. Jesus didn't seem to fit the expectations of the world, did he? He didn't come to conquer by force. He came to conquer by love. We don't serve him because we have to. We serve him because we want to. Because he's lowly and gentle. He rides the donkey into town. The, crowns, the crowds throng him. They lay branches before him, palm branches, which was a sign of victory. They lay their cloaks before him, which was an act of submission, saying, basically, you can walk all over us. We are yours. And did you hear what they're saying? Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna means save us. Save us now. Do you remember when the angel came to Joseph back there in the early part of Matthew? You shall name him Jesus. Why? He shall save his people from their sins. Jesus means save us. They're calling for Jesus. Hosanna, come and save us. In Psalms 118, it's just almost right exactly in the middle of your Bible if you were to open it up. And there's that verse 24 that uh, we love. I, I, I assume you do, I do anyway. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who, he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. This is a messianic psalm, and they knew it, and they're shouting it. The Messiah has come, they're excited. The phrase, Son of David, is reference to the Messiah. And Luke mentions that the religious leaders implored Jesus to tell his disciples to, to quiet down. I mean, after all, he's saying, this is not a Pentecostal revival. Keep it quiet. And Jesus says, if those who are made in the image of God 
will not praise the Creator, the Son of God. Then the creation itself, even the rocks itself, will cry out in praise to Him. Now the Palm Sunday is a good time to talk about the triumphal entry, but I'm sure, I'm sure you've heard this story before. And if you're like some of us and you are pre-digital era, you may have even seen this on flannel graph in Sunday school. But this is an event in the life of our Savior that took place in a land far, far away in a time long, long ago. What difference does it make to us? Let me give you some takeaways, okay? First of all, that God is a God of history. He planned it out. It was his plan. He planned the events. He planned the events leading up to the crucifixion, the resurrection. He actually planned the crucifixion, the resurrection. He told his disciples often. They didn't always understand it. They didn't always accept it. He told his followers he had to go to Jerusalem. He had to suffer many things, the religious leaders. And he would be killed, but he would be raised again on the third day. God is the God of history. He's also sovereign. He's in control. He can take care of this world, and he can take care of your world as well. There's nothing going to happen in your life today or tomorrow that's going to surprise him. God is not going to wake up one morning and start wringing his hands saying, Oh my, what am I going to do? There's that teenage boy, Joe, down there. He was in a car accident and he's seriously injured. What am I going to do? There's Mary over there and she's got cancer and she's got three small children. What are we going to do? There's Bill over there who's two months behind on his house payment. He just lost his job. I wish I'd have known this earlier. No, no, no. Nothing's going to surprise God. God's in control. You need to give it to him. There's nothing in your life that's going to happen that God cannot handle. There's nothing you will go through that God will not be there with you. God is the God of history, and that includes your history as well as his. Matthew presents to us Jesus as king. In this passage, Jesus is letting us know that he is king. According to the prophet Zechariah that was quoted, he is king. In a book entitled The Last Week, written by Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crucian, they say that at basically the same time that Jesus was riding in on a donkey from the east side of Jerusalem, there was someone else riding into Jerusalem from the west side. Oh, he was riding on a white horse. He had soldiers standing in front of him and beside him and behind him, clearing the way. It was none other than Pontius Pilate. It was a great show of power and military strength. You see, the Passover to the Jews was like the 4th of July to Americans. It was the day they became a nation. It was the day they remembered when they were freed from Egyptian bondage, when they escaped slavery, when they crossed the Red Sea and finally entered the Promised Land. And you see, it had only been just a few decades before that the Romans had taken over the land of Palestine, taken control, and Pilate knows this is their liberation day. He knows this is the day they celebrate becoming a nation. He knows that there will be about four times the number of people in Jerusalem that normally live there. He knows that they would love to be free once again. He knows they would like to get rid of the Romans. There's an air of Jew Jewish nationalism blowing in the breeze. So he's making his show of power, challenging those who would dare to confront Roman authority. The Jewish hope for a Messiah is that he would come and be a great military king like King David. They would drive the Romans into the Mediterranean Sea, drive them out once and for all, restore them as a powerful nation. Jesus came as a king, but not as an earthly king, but as a spiritual king. He's one who rules. He rules in the hearts of men and women. He didn't do what they hoped. 
He did not meet their expectations. So before the week is out, some of those have been crying, Hosanna to the son of David, are crying, crucify him, crucify him. You remember the sign over the cross? It simply said, King of the Jews. Now, Jesus did not meet their expectation as an earthly military leader. Has Jesus failed to meet your expect expectations at time? If not, uh, maybe you haven't given a lot of thought. Because I think there's always times when we think God ought to act one way and he acted some way differently. But let me ask you this. Do you want him to respond according to your way or according to his way? Which way do you think would be better for your life? Your way or his way? You see, I'm not so sure, but what prayer isn't more for changing our heart than changing God's mind. You see, if you can trust Jesus because he filled, fulfilled all the prophecies about the Messiah, don't forget to... For, Remember his promise about he's coming back again. So we need to honor him as king. We need to honor him. We need to praise him. And if you love him, you'll be singing his praises. If you don't like singing and praising Jesus now, I hate to tell you this, but you may be unhappy in heaven. Here's what they're singing in heaven. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Wow, and one chapter before that, they cast their crowns down before the throne saying, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Did you notice? Did you notice how that passage ends? Jesus entered Jerusalem. And the whole city was stirred. And they ask, who is this? Who is this? You know, that's a question that you and I have to answer as well. Who is this, Jesus? Your answer to that question will not only affect your worldview, it will determine your eternal destination. Who is this? Did you hear the answer to the crowds? They said, well, this is Jesus. He's a prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. They were right. But the answer was woefully inadequate. He wasn't just a prophet. He's creator. He's king of kings. He's lord of lords. And he wants to be your king. He wants to be your lord. He wants to be your savior. He wants... He wants to enter... And might I add, he wants to enter triumphantly into your heart and your life. Will you let him in? Will you let him in? We're going to sing an invitation hymn. If you've never let the king into your heart and life, we invite you to come as we stand and as we sing. I hear the 
Savior say, Thy strength in me this small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. You know, when we think of Palm Sunday, what's the first thing that kind of comes to your mind? Like Wayne said earlier, Jesus coming into uh, the town with people worshiping him, and, and he's coming in town a little differently than what everybody thought he was going to be. You know, as Wayne said, they were expecting a conquering general to take over and give them what they want. And then a few days later, he's on a cross. So what happened? Well, Jesus wasn't telling them what they wanted to hear. He, he, he gave them a different message, and when they heard that message, that really didn't solve their problems. So they decided he had no use to them, but he did. He sacrificed, he died on the cross, and he rose for us so that we'd have eternal life. And that's not really that much different than what we experience today, is it? You know, sometimes we all are looking for a particular answer to a prayer. Uh, we pray about a specific thing, or we want somebody else to change, and we pray and we pray. And uh, then we think, well, you know, Jesus really isn't helping us very much, so it, he kind of falls on deaf ears. The people that uh, do have that relationship with Jesus, who, as he told us to remember him at this time of communion, they remember him by, how do you remember anybody in a relationship? You know, we were talking in Bible study this morning, and, you know, all relationships take work. And the minute you put the W-O-R-K word in front of something, uh, we kind of shy away from a little bit, don't we? We're like, gee, we'd rather just kind of pray and get a quick answer and get this thing solved and move forward. But to have the true blessing of a relationship with Christ, we do have to remember him. We have to pray. We have to come to him as a child so that we are not praying for things that we shouldn't be, but actually praying for that relationship with God so that he does 
influence our lives and that everything we do, uh, you know, it says that you should pray unceasingly, you know, and when you think about that, how do you pray unceasingly? Well, you have to always be ready for prayer. You have to do as God commanded you. You have to put him first, remember me and with your whole heart, mind, and, and soul worship me and do unto others and treat them as I would ask them, ask you to treat them. So as we come to this time of communion this morning, I want you all to kind of think about something this week. We all get, uh, uh, if you're like me, you turn on the news and you get mad and you shut it off and then you go to talk to 10 other people and pretty soon your head's spinning 40 different directions. And that's really not what we're supposed to be doing. So just as this week, as we're getting ready in the holy time of the season, just let's all just try this for one week. Think about when you get up in the morning, I am going to put God first. I am going to, in every decision, I'm going to try to consider God before I, I make that decision. And the person that I meet and the person that I talk to, I'm going to treat them a little bit differently. I'm going to have a little bit more patience. I'm going to go ahead and listen to their side of the story before I speak. And just spend a week of your life doing that. And the next Sunday when you come to church, see if things are just a little bit differently because you did do as he asked you. You remembered him. So at this time of communion, and of course, I do want to mention that uh, what do we do whenever God blesses us? And, and he will bless us if you put the time into the relationship. You remember him and all that you do, and you're also generous to others, and you're generous to uh, his cause here on earth to continue to promote him. So as we get ready um, to take this, uh, I'm going to close this with prayer, and then we will take our uh, communion leave our offerings. And... Uh, as we get ready, the diaconate is going to come forward. They're going to release us row by row. And then the communion is back. If you would go ahead and take your communion and leave your offering in the plates there. Uh, we do ask that you not gather at the back, but would go ahead and, and if you're going to visit for a little bit, which we encourage you to, uh, do that outside where it's uh, uh, in social distance, please. So let us come to the Lord in prayer. Father, we confess today our sins, specifically forgetting you, neglecting to remember and let Jesus' sacrifice resonate with us. Jesus, you are closer than we could ever possibly understand. We confess worry, for we know you say it does us no good. Even still, we worry and become anxious daily. We confess our lack of care and love for the other people you have placed in our lives. Father, our Savior laid down his life for every one of us centuries before we could ever walk on the earth. In the same sacrificial way, let us be willing to take up our crosses daily and lay down our lives for the people you have placed in them. In Jesus' name, O oh Lord, amen. And now we will take our communion.